Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce David Sullivan, who's gonna talk to us today. He comes to us uh, by way of uh, past duties in Virginia, Alabama, and St. Louis. He is a um, infectious disease physician and a faculty member here in MMI in the school. He's been here for quite some time. He has a career in malaria research, um, but has uh, recently turned to epidemiology and clinical research. And uh, what he doesn't know is that like everyone else here, he's an accidental trialist. He asked me to say that he's a bench scientist that's turned into a trialist, um, but we're all accidental trialists. So um, David's gonna talk to us today about the trials of convalescent plasma for COVID with uh, which um, some of us in the group here are also involved a little bit. So thank you, David, and go ahead. You, you are welcome. I do feel like I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle, uh, the novice talking to all the experts. Uh, but I'd like to talk about um, the past, um, uh, past couple months working on uh, randomized double-blinded clinical trials for SARS-CoV-2 infection prophylaxis and early treatment of COVID-19 as a foundation for other um, immediate and delayed immunotherapies, uh, better known as the DOD outpatient RCT convalescent plasma consortium. Uh, Shmuel Shoham is uh, taking his ID boards and uh, others are, uh, yeah. Uh, oops, let's see. Let's see, advancing. Okay, great, perfect. Uh, these are some uh, disclosures, um, some patents, royalties from um, um, providing proteins to um, a di diagnostic company and mainly, and then there is a, a company that I'm trying to work on a company. So just disclosures in the very, in the very beginning. Um, like to focus our attention, uh, ultra um, electron microscopy on the virus. This is uh, from in vitro cell cultures on respiratory cilia, but you can sort of see where the virus uh, here and in real life really coats uh, and takes over the um, cilia. This is, um, Next, from a patient in our clinical trials uh, who uh, came, um, was tested one day after symptom onset. She was enrolled on day three, transfused on day four, so early in the illness. She did well, but then presented with dyspnea, shortness of breath on hospital day 14. She did have some medical risk factors for severe disease, principally age um, and uh, a presentation, she had, um, um, yeah, she had new, new roles in, in the examination. Her C-reactive protein was normal during the first week, but a hospital presentation went up to 3.6. D-dimer, other measures of inflammation. But what's striking on this serial CT scan from front to back, you'll see that the anterior lungs are quite clear and the posterior is uh, full of ground glass opacities, we call them, or these uh, nodular rounded densities that are fairly characteristic of SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia. And this is part of the reason why proning or having people lie on their stomach increases aeration because the blood flows to the aerated parts of the lung and uh, will improve it. But I mean, that's why we're all focused on this talk. It's the virus, eyes on the virus, or as I like to say recently, eyes on the plasma. Uh, so we, um, the whole project is looking at early outpatient COVID-19 treatment or infection prevention. The whole premise is we're not going to get ourselves out of this pandemic if we wait till everyone comes to the hospital. That's too late. So the whole premise of this work is that we can work on preventing people from going to the hospital or getting an infection. Convalescent plasma is immediate delivery of antibodies from someone who has already defeated the virus and has highly tailored, highly specific antibodies. The antibodies last for a month or two in a circulation and 
that individuals have thousands of different antibodies, not just one or two that we see in the Regeneron Eli Lilly monoclonals. So in this time period, Hopkins did receive IND approval. We established the plasma donor protocols, developed two outpatient protocols on infection prevention, early treatment. We activated almost 28 clinical trial centers. Uh, this is all since April. Um, and they traditional academic centers, some large community hospital programs and medical facilities serving the Navajo and Apache nation. I mean, the whole basis is that <clears throat> we want to be able to target after we show efficacy in this work, we wanna be able to target people in nursing homes, Indian reservations, high risk military operations, uh, where you really need to uh, have the mission continue, or as I say, walk and chew COVID gum. Um, our structure for this clinical trial is spread out throughout the country. We'll get to that. And uh, this foundation that we built will provide an avenue for further subgroup analysis um, uh, when or if efficacy is, is, is shown. So I'm gonna break up the talk a little bit to some science background as underpinning the clinical trial, uh, why we're driven. I'd like to walk you through some time sequence of regulatory funding, talk about the people making up the trial, uh, introduce this concept of blood bank as a research institute rather than just a clinical bet. Talk a little bit about COVID space. That's been part of our, um, of our battles with uh, getting the clinical research going. And we'll also talk about uh, recruitment with a couple of stories in, in, in between. So in general, there's like three weekly phases to uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. The first week, a high viral load uh, with mild outpatient symptoms. And then it's the second week that people usually present to the hospital um, and maybe the third week that they may go. This is a typical pattern in general, more, more than half. Uh, although some people can present within three days of onset and go uh, straight to the unit depending on underlying illness. Uh, this also graph depicts that antivirals and plasma work best when given early. That's gonna be a common theme. Um, and probably you know, the, best, uh, the best take home is uh, earlier, uh, the better. Immune modulators um, uh, are best during this, uh, dur dur during this uh, second phase of illness by itself. Uh, I am a malariologist. My first science paper was on chloroquine and its mechanism of action against malaria. Uh, I will note that the IC50 for, against the parasite is like 10 nanomolar but um, against all these viruses in a test tube, you're at 10 micromolar for all of these. And so it inhibits many viruses and it's been tried um, in clinical trials for uh, most of these viruses, but there's not a single virus for which hydroxychloroquine has been shown to uh, influence clinical outcome. Um, as I said before in March, if, if hydroxychloroquine really worked, we would have known it right away. I mean, if something works, patients are smart, doctors are smart, it works. Hydroxychloroquine does not work against the virus. We're not waiting on any drug cavalry either. It's gonna be a long time for EIDD 2801 or other ones to arrive. I mean, they're a year or two at the fastest from arrival. So we really don't have, I mean, right now, it's sit at home, wait till you get to the hospital. So what is plasma? Plasma, if you centrifuge whole blood with anticoagulation, then you get this uh, uh, yellow clear part above the white blood cells and the red blood cells. Uh, immunoglobulins have been used for um, and are used, monoclonal antibodies. There was uh, uh, one approved for uh, Ebola, not in the United States, but worldwide, but hyperimmune globulin has, uh, so antibody therapies has been part of our medical armamentarium for many years. Uh, so convalescent plasma is really the first step in passive immediate immunity, delivering antibodies 
uh, right away. It's widely available, easily obtained. You do have to match the blood groups. Uh, hyperimmune globulin is a derivative. Uh, plasma contains IgG, IgM, um, many other factors, albumin. Uh, hyperimmune globulin just purifies out just the IgG fraction, leaving behind IgM and uh, I, IgA, typo here, uh, should be IgA. And then um, Regeneron, Eli Lilly have made two neutralizing antibodies uh, to the top of the, yeah, have made two uh, neutralizing antibodies that we'll talk about. And this is all immediate immunity before vaccines are, you uh, give someone a jab, protein, RNA, then you wait a month or two, and then they, it's a delayed immunity. And, but you can, uh, vaccines won't take in all populations, especially the elderly, there are gonna be people for which are not gonna have access to it or because of immunosuppression. So we need something as a complement to vaccines and we need something now. Uh, so in a way, if we're putting all our hopes on vaccines working, then antibodies immediately are gonna to work too. It's all antibody therapy. It doesn't matter really when you get it, but the vaccines are just a way of, of uh, efficiently spreading it out rather than focusing on those with the most, with the most need. Uh, so this is looking back through time on convalescent plasma efficacy. Uh, it was uh, given as prevention, gamma globulin, 80% protection from requiring polio virus for five weeks. Uh, the best randomized clinical trial showing efficacy of convalescent plasma was this case of Argentine hemorrhagic fever, uh, where they measured a case fatality rate of 1% in the 91 people who got antibodies uh, in the convalescent plasma, and it was 16% uh, in those who got the control. It was used widely in 1918, uh, sort of halved uh, more mortality, a little bit of a decrease in SARS-CoV-2-1 and, and influenza, it's a little bit mixed. Uh, some, depending on the titer of plasma and uh, the case series historic controls is either having or doesn't make much of a difference. So there is a long track record with it. Uh, I do remember, uh, uh, looking at old antimalarials, derivatives of doxychloroquine, which are given for pneumonia. And um, so plasma therapy serum for bacterial pneumonia have the mortality um, in large hospital trials, but that's still uh, better than, uh, than nothing. And it's about what we're getting with uh, what we're seeing in mortality in the hospital. But if you look back to the literature in the 30s and the 40s, where there was just serum therapy before antibiotics uh, for bacterial pneumonia, then you sort of saw that same halving of the mortality. Um, and so, and all of, well, another recurring theme, give it early, uh, but the tighter matters, the antibodies level. So you got to hit hard and hit early. Um, so in our studies, we're getting rid of a third of all the convalescent plasma that has a low titer below a cutoff here of one to 320. Ortho is a little bit of different metric, but it's just yards versus meters. Um, and um, it's still, if you sort of take the upper two thirds of uh, people with antibody levels, uh, and then, but you will hear in the literature people talking about this receptor binding domain versus the whole spike protein. And so we qualify our donors on any antibody reactivity anywhere on the spike protein. But when we talk about neutralization, then it's just the antibodies that bind to this receptor binding domain in green. This is the ACE2 receptor interacting with the receptor binding domain. Um, uh, for which uh, we've all become virologists and recognize the terms of ACE2, of ACE2 receptor. Um, so um, we started out the clinical trial. Um, uh, these are the uh, clinical trial um, numbers for infection prevention. Um, and uh, this gives you a little bit of the rationale for uh, uh, the, the, the sample sizes um, and based on uh, 
18% event rate of hospitalizations. And we sort of came up with 600 or 50% reduction in that number. Uh, we'll get into the uh, work of Dave Shade, Stefan, and Brian Lau on our, our sample size uh, projections, which have all been sound, but it's been difficult to predict uh, rate of reduction and even event rates. This is just a pictorial view of exactly how uh, the trial is set up. We get COVID-19 uh, recovered patients a month afterwards. They've been screened negative for uh, viruses or other bacterial infections. We also make certain that the in a, uh, CLIA lab, it's just a process. There's nothing approved at all by the FDA on any tests. No diagnostic test is approved. There's, everything's allowed. But we do it in a CLIA certified. It just means that they handle it in a uh, rigorous fashion. Uh, then we randomize uh, individuals. And, um, and yeah, Dave Shade came through for us when we were switching from ICON to the other one. He sort of wrote a program for randomization that was critical in the very, the very beginning. Uh, we were making a transition. And then we give it to patients and we look for e e event rates. Um, this is uh, finishing up the science. This is uh, a depiction of how long antibodies last. This is last. This is theoretical. Um, so we're giving a product, let's say a ratio of one to 320, but it has a volume distribution or it's diluted down. We're giving about 6%, 200 mils. 200 mils is 1 15th of a three liter volume in a six liter adult, six liter of whole blood, three, about three liters of plasma. 200 mils is 1 15th. And the volume and distribution is into three to six liters. So you sort of have a dilution. Um, um, if you start out at one to 320, you're gonna hit the ground uh, at about one to 20, but then the half-life is approximately three weeks. Uh, so you can have persistently high antibody levels for um, six to eight weeks, depending on the titer. But just to say that this is a single dose, long-lived antibody neutralization. And this is just sort of comparing, although the spearman coefficient is low, uh, I, 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 I take that. We have other, uh, uh, other data. It's a little bit better. Uh, but I mean, it's to say that there's a rough correlation between uh, viral neutralization in the y-axis and in the x-axis is antibodies which are binding to the receptor binding domain uh, that interacts with the, ACE, uh, with the ACE2 receptor. Um, this gets back to work that was done in the 30s, Simon Flexner, same Flexner with the Flexner reports that sort of put Hopkins on the map. Um, they actually used serum, which it's instead of plasma that's anticoagulated, you just let blood clot and you just take the serum. They didn't do anything else, but they did an intrathecal injection. So putting a needle into the CSF um, and directly into the brain. Uh, imagine doing 1300 cases, 1,300 of that. That must've been quite a study back in the thirties. Uh, but they did show for bacterial meningitis, that the earlier that you gave uh, the serum therapy, um, you had uh, an 18% first uh, from one to day three of illness, 27%, and then after the seventh day, thir uh, 36. Um, and then uh, this is just looking at death rate between um, 30% uh, versus control, 85%. Um, again, having mortality in the people presenting to the hospital. So this was an uh, this was an early an early lesson. Um, so uh, that's sort of some of the scientific basis. I'm going to start to sort of give you some of the the time course. I mean, looking back on it, all the days were long um, and they were very busy and. When I look, we'll look back through the notes, it seems like, boy, this just took a couple of days to do this. But um, it, um, yeah, it was uh, exciting, fun work. Arturo Costadoval, February 27th, um, uh, penned a piece that appeared in the Wall Street Journal. A school physician's approach to measles in 1934 had le has lessons for coronavirus. 
what actually happened, well, actually, my son just graduated from the Naval Academy a year or two ago. He uh, turned down scholarships for engineering because he wanted to go to the Naval Academy. And he ended up going to the same school where this measles outbreak was reported, the Hill School outside of uh, Philadelphia. So I walked the grounds where in 1934, there was a measles outbreak. Uh, about 100 kids, 22 of them had never had me measles or seronegative, and they took uh, the serum from someone that had recovered and then injected in, uh, to the behinds of the remaining kids just two mils of serum um, and uh, stopped the measles outbreak dead in its tracks. And this was reported as infection prevention um, the earlier, the, the better. Um, Tony Fauci, in, you know, in early March had written about convalescent plasma, putting it on the table, but it was really this Wall Street Journal article by Turo that galvanized a grassroots structure for hospital-based convalescent plasma, kind of led by uh, it just the way it fell out. Mayo, uh, Michael Joyner uh, worked on that, uh, on the hospital base, got uh, expanded uh, access or uh, EAP, um, expanded access uh, 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 permissions. And I mean, that was later down the road. March 6, uh, day of a thesis presentation for one of my students. I emailed Sanjay Kumar at the FDA. He works on <laughs> parasitic infections in the blood bank uh, at the FDA. And then he said, well, you should contact Evan Block about convalescent plasma. I said, you know, do you what can we do to mobilize it? And then I called Evan and he said, hmm, good idea. And he, I put him together with Arturo. And then, I mean, I took a couple of days off, just a week or two, was kind of concentrated on hydroxychloroquine. But on March 16th, looking ahead, I saw that if we're gonna use plasma, we should be able to measure it. So on Monday, March 16th, I walked down and spoke to uh, Mario Catarugli in pathology and said, you know, can, do you all have ELISA plates to measure antibodies? And he said, uh, no, not yet. And I said, well, um, I think they were about a thousand bucks a plate. Uh, you could do a hundred a plate, so 10 bucks um, a well. And I said, it's gonna be a good investment. Go ahead and get 10, I'll have money. So well, pathology will do it. So we ordered some plates, they arrived like that Thursday or afterwards, and the rest is a little bit of history. Um, his sort of assay is our gold standard for measuring uh, the ELISA plates. And he just took off with it and standardized it, uh, submitted the protocol to the FDA. Um, March 18th, two days later, uh, Wednesday, got this email from my chair. I mean, you pay attention to emails from your chair, right? Uh, said, David, can we chat on the phone? I need a point person who's clinically trained to handle the supplemental applications. Um, he was just so busy handling the firestorm from the press that, and he had, he just needed uh, an ID doc like myself in the department uh, to help him out with some supplement uh, applications. So I called him back. That was, and then, um, uh, well, we'll talk about funding later. Um, so that was about March uh, eight, eight, 18th. And I guess I want to march through a little bit on the regulatory time course. I mean, that's sort of how I got going. Arturo said, I need some help getting some supplemental funding. And then I pivoted. That's where I pivoted, March 18th, um, and started working on the convalescent plasma uh, coming away from drugs. I mean, my whole career has really been based on drugs. Uh, diagnostics and drugs, and it's just, well, sometimes they're easier to work with than antibodies. That's just my perspective. Uh, then um, I was working with Schmuel, getting added to his protocol about 10 days later. Uh, again, School of Public Health has a five-year limit on all the training, School of Medicine, three years. So one Sunday afternoon, six hours, 16 modules, all IRB uh, re renewals, but got it done. April 2nd, I, um, I saw that there was a gap with no outpatient therapy. Everyone was focused on the hospital. Shmuel was focused on infection prevention, but I said, 
you know, plasma should work as an outpatient. That's where it's going to have the best use people early in the disease. I talked to Lisanne Prozowski and she said she didn't have any bandwidth. She was up in, uh, up, up in New York. So at nine o'clock, April 2nd, I told Arturo Shmuel and Dan Hanley that I would take over the mild disease trial. Um, the rest was a little bit of history. Stayed up, um, was fairly inspired, uh, completed the first draft on April the 3rd, uh, sent it to Brian Lau, uh, who can't say enough about, he's just fantastic. Uh, we could sort of called it the sniffle study in the beginning, sample size of a thousand. Primary endpoint in the beginning was resolution of symptoms. I'm glad we got away from that. Brian uh, has some good advice. He returned it back to me tw uh, within 24 hours, uh, again, three o'clock uh, in the middle of the morning. Uh, and then just 10 days later, we sent the uh, revised protocol to the FDA under an existing IND. So it's the second protocol under 19725. By that time, the primary endpoint was hospitalization with 20% hospitalization rate and a 25% reduction with a calculation of 1344. There were some age stratifications that went into the numbers. Um, and then two days later, the FDA cold called me and uh, just happened to be, yeah, I was, I was at my desk. They asked me two or three minor questions. And then um, I saw, great, I'm gonna get the, uh, get the approval. And I sort of waited on Friday, didn't hear. Monday, still didn't hear. And then I said, uh, so I just emailed them on Tuesday and said, um, you know, I thought, well, a week. I mean, usually you're given 30 days. I said, you know, a, a, a week. And they say, oh, it slipped through the cracks. And then the letter, it was approved on Thursday, the 16th, the day that we called you. So it just took two days. So the FDA was working fast. It was on the radar. Uh, they were working fast. So on that same day, submitted um, the IRB um, to, um, on April the 16th. And it was just, you know, looking back, it took 12 days, but it seemed like a lifetime, seemed like 12 years to push the IRB through. There were a lot of revisions, flurry of emails, uh, responding to concerns and getting everything straight. It was a major protocol for me, one of the first times that I've, uh, well, I was actually, I, I sort of had compassion to use IV artesanate, but I already had a protocol uh, that I just had to uh, paste in. And then one of the big arguments that, um, sort of got lost a little bit in all this is I talked to uh, my neighbor is an OB doc um, and talked to uh, Jeannie Sheffield and everyone agreed that women should be included in research, especially pregnant women. Um, and for convalescent plasma, it makes sense. It's not like a drug. We're not going to worry about thalidomide toxicity. It's not a drug. And uh, Antibodies are given all throughout pregnancy. We give vaccines and antibody preparation, so it was safe. So it really hinged upon, at that time, only about 3,000 people had gotten SARS-CoV-2 convalescent antibodies. They were worried about, well, are you going to make disease worse? And, you know, is it safe? But I was able to, just within a day, find the data on the safety. And um, Craig Hendricks was... Um, on the IRB panel, but um, was able to, to vouch that we had safety data and we did get that included. So I was very glad to, um, well, yeah, looking back and proud that we were able to uh, argue, again, reasonable people um, looking at reasonable uh, safety, you know, could say, well, maybe hold off on it. But uh, in retrospect, pregnant women are relatively asymptomatic and uh, don't have severe COVID-19. Um, uh, although, well, we can talk about the hospitalization rate. Uh, so that's sort of the regulatory panel. It really already had things uh, FDA approved, IRB approved April 28th. And I just wanted to list the numerous change in researchers. These are not just change minor ones, these are major ones. Uh, so almost 22 of them. Uh, spread out uh, every day or two. So um, Meg Singleton runs a good shop. It's, it's all reasonable. There's lots of work, but um, they do uh, have careful scrutiny and it's all, it's all good. So back to funding. I had an idea 
but you need money to do a clinical trial. And I didn't have time to write a grant and wait a year. Um, so 318, Arturo asked me to write some supplements to the NIH. Uh, the next day he said, David, I need a one pager uh, to go to Al Summer, uh, um, who will present it to Bloomberg. So that night wrote the one pager and uh, for convalescent plasma. And then, um, and then six days later, submitted a competitive revision with Arturo for National Heart Lung Blood uh, Institute for inpatient and outpatient convalescent plasma studies. Uh, a couple uh, sort of revised the Bloomberg ask for uh, a one pager to Collins. I don't know if it actually got sent. Uh, but then uh, March 27th, it did another competitive revision to NIAD for inpatient and outpatient convalescent plasma studies. On that same day, uh, we did get word that Bloomberg was able to, Bloomberg Philanthropy was able to steer money to us. In some respects, um, it was fair, it was parked already at Hopkins reallocation. Um, and, uh, but the state of Maryland at that same time, so we had $4 million uh, to, launch, uh, to launch the studies. And so we decided early in, uh, in April um, that we needed some outside help. We had had some conversations with a David Hoover uh, at a contract research organization, ICON, and it sort of built to, well, let's go to multiple sites. Let's see if we can get home transfusions. And ICON wanted to do some um, modeling exercises for the next pandemic, how rapidly we could uh, pull it up. And we were approaching or drafting an ask for 65 million, but uh, we sort of, it got, it got delayed. We thought that we were, they just had to make a decision, but, um, and, but by the middle of May, it was clear that um, what we had drafted was just a white paper that we needed to write a full grant. And in the end, the BARDA funding didn't come through at all. We never really heard. We worked with ICON on it, but without that BARDA funding, then ICON didn't have a clear means of getting paid. They had done, actually they had done pro bono work for us and had written that, you know, they could help us out with product management uh, experience. Uh, and then they had now wanted some money up front, but we didn't have that much money uh, to, we didn't want to give them 20, 25% of our available funds when, you know, we saw funds going down, down the road. So on May 13th, I, um, talked to malaria buddy of mine in the army who was in Thailand. And he said, oh, you should talk to Kara Schmidt. Uh, ends up Shmuel Shoam also, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Schmidt, uh, also talked to Mike Joyner who said, ah, maybe talk to Colonel Schmidt. So Shmuel and I ended up making an appointment. We talked to her at the same time. And on May 14th, um, the next day, I drafted two white papers for funding and independent for uh, infection prevention, which they were really interested in in early treatment for military applications. And then uh, six days later, um, they uh, invited us for a full proposal on May, on, on May 20th, which was a Wednesday. I was pretty busy all day Wednesday, really couldn't get cracking on it till Wednesday night. But by Friday, we had put together 60 pages grant, 20 pages it was science, a lot was other was clinical trials, had a lot of help from BIOS, Dan Hanley and, 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 uh, and colleagues. Uh, so we put together the $16 million proposal in two days, uh, had it submitted, and then uh, a week later had heard some good news. It was uh, favorably uh, reviewed. But then it took another uh, week or 10 days to sort of sign the contracts. Um, and then we were off with 16 million for 150 patients infection prevention and 300 for uh, er, uh, early treatment as the first draft as uh, given by the numbers. Um, uh, during the same time period, I got an email and phone message from second in command at the FDA, Janet Woodcock. Um, she was 
Um, and then um, Dan Hanley playing chess, uh, uh, set up a appointment with uh, Janet Woodcock. We could all meet. We talked about small sample sizes and uh, involved the, F, uh, the DOD in those discussions and that, yeah, we were underpowered. Um, and so at June 18th, we sent in a revision that that really doubled uh, our size up to 500 in infection prevention, 600 in early treatment. So we asked for an additional 18 million. It's an other transfer agreement. It's not a grant, it's a cost reimbursable uh, approval. Um, and then July 7th, uh, finally heard that the competitive revision for a million dollars was approved to support lab work on convalescent plasma. The one to the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute was not approved. They had gotten a substantially less amount of money. So, but that was in July, that June, July, that we really finally had funding. And then in October, uh, we submitted uh, a supplement for another 10 million. So in the end, um, it's 45 million uh, NIH, uh, 1 million mainly for lab work. State of Maryland was a million, Bloomberg was three. And then we did get some additional funding from some uh, foundations listed here. So we sort of have uh, funding, uh, funding in place. Um, what we told the FDA is they said, we can't fund a clinical trial. We don't know how to do that with this other transfer, but we can fund a prototype. So it's sort of like building a plane. They want a prototype. So the prototype was plasma um, with neutralizing antibodies sufficient to prevent and stop disease progression uh, that would uh, enable essential military and civilian persons to function without compromise for at least two months. Um, and then we talked about creating uh, multiple sites for stockpiling high uh, tighter uh, level of uh, antibodies utilized for military and civilian populations. So this is, this is what we've been asked to deliver upon. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that was, um, and yeah, this summer kind of heady. I mean, it's not often that I get asked to talk to uh, Tony Fauci, just wanted to hear about plasma. Uh, it was with the hospital plasma, but also the outpatient. And then on um, Monday, July 27th, uh, 7.50 in the morning, I get an email from Francis Collins and said, uh, addressed to me and said, uh, David, I want you to talk about with Shmuel convalescent plasma the next day at noon, uh, get some slides, get, get a single slide together. And uh, then there was a big powwow, mainly focused on hospitals. I don't think Francis Collins really at that time ascertained the sharp distinction between outpatient and hospital. He was more focused on uh, convalescent plasma for hospitals. Tony Fauci did not want to perpetuate ambiguity by not having good RCT. And so they were, uh, NIH was really advocating for <clears throat> uh, good solid data rather than having weaker data perpetuating uh, ambiguity. And Francis wanted to know, well, he said, if money was no object, what could you do? And so in August, um, uh, talking with Dan Hanley and others, we, I drafted, a problem solution approach um, to accelerate. The whole idea, idea was, do you want an answer? This is August. Do you want an answer by election day on outpatient convalescent plasma therapy? Or do you want to take six months? And um, so we had 20, um, at that time, we had 26 sites that we had engaged in uh, for the cost reimbursable. So we had a funding mechanism and that we could supplement to accelerate uh, getting an answer for this. And uh, that it would involve accelerating rapid diagnostics. At, during the summertime, again, people were taking a week, but if you're to get a diagnostic test result, but if your eligibility window from onset of symptoms was a week, then many of the diagnostic testing wasn't gonna work. 
We also had to increase our seven day per week transfusion capabilities and then focus on doing data entry monitoring analysis in real time to get early October results. So in June, I thought I'd have results by end of August. In August, I said election day. Today, I'm saying January. A uh, little bit more confident of that, but it's always, everyone says, well, when are you gonna know, David? And I have, uh, was thinking yesterday um, and I mean, we'll just see. But so these were the problems that we identified with running a convalescent plasma therapy trial in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, the biggest problem was um, a fundamental lack of rapid, accurate diagnostic test. And so we said, well, as a government, as the DOD, as the NIH, why not focus diagnostic capabilities at sites, at cities where we already have uh, plenty of need? And so let's just uh, uh, rise, raise the tide, float many boats, and we're gonna saturate um, cities where we have sites with increased capability of diagnostic testing. So we said, well, 12, 12 million bucks um, uh, would, would improve that and would improve access. Um, so that was one problem solution that we came up with and we justified it. This is to Francis Collins. Uh, we also said that uh, based on uh, our experience with calling our COVID positive list at Hopkins, that only one to 3% of positive individuals enroll in these outpatient studies, which was fairly low. That's, I mean, we're calling a hundred people, uh, good uh, uh, elbow grease work uh, uh, that I know pretty well. And that we said, you know, we, a solution would be to get uh, professional English and Spanish speaking call centers um, um, to allow study physicians coordinators to, to concentrate on consenting and enrollment. So we had a budget uh, for the call centers. Another problem was the low level of public awareness of the value of outpatient treatment to return to normal function. No messaging directed at um, uh, high risk communities. So our solution was an advertising agent, agency, a media company uh, to work on uh, getting out the message uh, to maybe change uh, the uh, above problem. Uh, so we had, uh, had some bids in progress. That was a couple million dollars. Uh, so once you sort of solve, I mean, in the end, convalescent plasma is simple. You have patients, you have transfusion, and then you follow them. Um, and so, but we were having seeing troubles at Hopkins and at other sites that many sites were just open two or three days a week because of the availability of transfusion nurses um, and uh, closed on the weekend. So that, uh, uh, and so we said, well, you know, let's go ahead and just hire three full-time transfusionists each of the 30 sites. Uh, uh, let's try to pay them more. Um, and so that's just a mere 13 million. And the whole scheme of things is not much money to get an answer quickly. Um, another problem was part-time study coordinators. I mean, I, I had one full-time coordinator. She got pulled back to a regular job. I got two other ones that were, uh, uh, were off uh, because their research was down. And then finally I got another uh, two months later, had to get uh, two more uh, coordinators. So, um, I mean, everything was part-time. And so we said, you know, let's pay some full-time full-time coordinators and data entry people um, and try to increase their salaries. Another problem was just space. And so um, again, it's just like a rapid test may not be rapid or in a mobile clinic usually isn't mobile. Uh, <laughs> lessons that you learn. Um, and usually the mobile clinics just mean that you can move it from one place to another, but then it's permanent. Um, and so we sort of costed that out about mirroring uh, diagnostics and transfusion centers. Um, and then site management, institutional paralysis, overcoming barriers. Um, and so we had laid all, out all these problems and solutions and Francis Collins uh, actually looked at the price and said, well, Cyrene's just doing it for a 10th of, of the rate and uh, we'll just go with the C3PO emergency room trial and it got bought, but this was for outpatient. He's focused on inpatient, um, and but we had the solution for for it back in August. In the end, 
we're sort of ad partially addressing this um, at the present time. I'm gonna switch gears, talk about people. Um, and um, this is sort of an org chart in May of um, uh, transfusion medicine and uh, the sites that we had at the time. Um, and, but I really kind of want to talk a little bit about the heroes of the study. Um, always have been through thick and thin, Dan Hanley, Nicole McBee, Karen Lane, Amy Gawad, uh, supported by everyone at BIOS. Marianne Cote helped us uh, at Duke uh, to, with a uh, um, clinical trials network. Yvonne Higgins was sort of came out of retirement and uh, as a research coordinator and really mobilized things for us at Hopkins. She was invaluable. Uh, Steph Katz was a nurse manager, also just critical, able to navigate uh, the system. Mark Sokowski and Dan Ford provided leadership on a bird's eye level. Um, Meg Singleton, Craig Hendricks and Howard Letterman uh, helped us with the IRB. And yeah, I'm proud of Hopkins IRB. Uh, everyone says it's slow, but it's sure, and they do a good job. Jeannie Carulli is an unsung her hero. She sort of navigated the COVID positive list for which we got most of our uh, recruiting. Always available, a list generated at seven o'clock in the morning, and that's been great. Gil has been, um, uh, got things done, and that's been great to have people for facilities at our Green Springs Center. Cindy McGinnis always had a solution to IRBs, written consents. And then um, uh, a list of angels on the nursing staff, Kim Kafka, Cindy Sparks, Michaela Olson, Alana Ali, Amanda, Jennifer, and uh, nurses who've gone above and beyond the call of duty to help out with transfusion seven days a week, phlebotomist Kat Wren, and then uh, study coordinators, uh, medical monitors at the Hopkins site, uh, Nikki Diane, Sonali Smita, Atika, and Bacola. Blood Bank Group, Christy, Sandra, Melissa, Rivka, Eric, Gary, um, and then Larry Appel uh, really helped at critical times with our justification uh, to DOT and Janet Woodcock on our sample size and for funding. And then uh, finances, uh, standing on the shoulders for all the contracts, Lisa and Joe, and then the DCC, Dave Shade, Stefan, uh, I've already mentioned Brian, um, Rick Thompson and others, uh, and then pediatrics, other uh, ID docs that have stepped up and, and been a part of uh, this study and other studies in, in, in the hospital itself. Uh, another phase, yeah, I'll try to finish up in a couple of minutes and get some questions, was, um, um, so that's the, and again, it's a changing C dynamic of persons coming in and out of the jobs, managing that uh, both here and in other sites has been difficult to navigate. But I mean, what this convalescent plasma is teaching us sort of what we always know is that plasma therapy works. It's been superseded by drugs, but this is some data back in malaria, classic paper, McGregor and Cohen, where serum from um, Gambian um, adults uh, uh, did decrease parasite counts. Um, uh, and then this is from uh, 1990, where you give... Uh, uh, IgG treatments, and you see a, a drop in uh, parasite count. So convalescent plasma is going to work for malaria. It's going to work for uh, maybe difficult to treat um, bacterial diseases, multi-drug resistant bacterial diseases. And once the infrastructure is set up for COVID, it's going to be used and open up uh, a whole, I think, a whole new realm of medicine coming back to antibody as uh, convalescent plasma as uh, therapy by itself. Space has been an issue. This is in a Weinberg Oncology space where uh, we had about six rooms set up with these HEPA filters uh, vented out and you have uh, negative pressure. Doesn't cost that much. You can use existing space, uh, but that has sort of been reclaimed. I've been moved. I was at Bayview, um, the clinical uh, people took it back. This space was at Weinberg was taken aback. And so I was a month at uh, Bayview uh, two or three months at Weinberg, and then now I'm at Green Spring Station. You can see a tent. On the left is the uh, 
is a big trailer, the side view of these uh, COVID positive pods, two of them, and then a storage set uh, uh, down in the background that's painted blue and white. Uh, this is the inside of these COVID positive sheds. This is before you have the examining room and just showing it. So it really is just a shipping container that we're doing transfusions in. We've done uh, more than 30 of them uh, there. Uh, they cost about 25 to 30,000 uh, rent and outfit for, uh, for a year's time. Uh, this is where all our sites are throughout the, um, the study site and red are the ones that were added recently and green were the original uh, uh, 15. And yeah, I don't have, uh, in the middle of May, Shmuel, Dan Hanley and I talked to 25 sites, 15 minutes, uh, speed dating almost. We asked them simple questions. Do you have space for COVID positive? Do you have uh, any experience with blood banking? And can you get contracts done quickly? Uh, it was an iterative process. We onboarded them in May, 15 sites, got more money, onboarded some others in August. Uh, and it's been great meeting uh, good researchers from around the country and helping them uh, break down um, institutional paralysis barriers to get the study up and going. So here's where we are on our numbers. Uh, infection prevention, August 8th, we're at 16 and 41, a total of 57 uh, for that third number. And then in green and purple is the weekly increase in total sites. Uh, so you can see that we're for early treatment, we've had a one month doubling time. It's been about a six week doubling time for infection uh, pre prevention. And I am proud Hopkins has been doing well, but I guess we uh, originated it and perfected at Hopkins. We can uh, translate it to other sites. And, uh, but this is just the scheme of uh, many of the other uh, institutions that are uh, running the trial. These are just the cumulative numbers, Hopkins in, in green and purple for the two, uh, for the two study sites. Uh, these are weekly numbers, Hopkins and non-Hopkins, where infection prevention over on the right, at Hopkins is about half of all the recruitments and uh, about a third for the uh, early treatment. This is a COVID positive list where in the beginning, uh, days since April, where Hopkins accounted for about 20% of all of Maryland's positives, we're doing 2000 tests a day we're still doing about 2,000, we're probably doing three or 4,000 tests a day. But, and then there's been a decrease down to about 10 on the uh, COVID positive list. Now it's been going up recently uh, and there's about 30 or 40, uh, but we're still having maybe a, a, a five or 10% uh, enrollment rate from that COVID positive list with the uh, cases uh, being fairly flat. Um, I'm gonna skip over this slide on account of time. This is just age dependent hospitalization rate from state data extracted from COVID tracking, uh, which is a great site. So here we are on our uh, numbers, uh, although we really need events. Uh, infection prevention is new infections, uh, early treatment is hospitalizations. Uh, and then we just passed October 28th, um, shout out to Brian, Stefan, Dave, Rick, Molly Ying, Carly Manchu and Aerotech Monitors were Good to continue, uh, DSMB board, um, and want us to uh, increase our recruiting in underserved areas. So what I've learned is it's been an exercise in clearing the way, getting rid of log jams, uh, being pleasantly, relentlessly persistent. Um, a, a no means there's an alternative path, or, or can you specify your no? Is it a, how general is that no? And that's been my exercise. It's been fun, it's been challenging. It's been a great group of people to work with and I'm pleased to sort of uh, uh, talk about it. I'm gonna stop there and uh, see if we can answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. So um, we'll be happy to take some questions now if anybody has any. You can so, put, yep, go ahead. This is Doug Jabs. Um, I don't have any questions, Dave, as you know, I've been per very peripherally involved. Uh, I have to congratulate the entire team on what has been a logistic tour de force. I mean, uh, 
you went over in great detail how hard it was to get this up and running in the midst of an epidemic. And uh, it, it's really been just a great job by everybody involved. I, I also would just wanna make a comment that these studies I consider critical. Um, many of us here have been involved in monoclonal antibody studies for infectious organisms where the phase two data suggested high efficacy and no toxicity. And the phase three data showed exactly the opposite, namely no efficacy and high mortality. Uh, and so the, the sort of compassionate use case uh, historical controlled studies give us some indication, but these clinical trials are what's gonna teach us exactly what we need to know about the use of, these, uh, of plasma in this disease. And so I think these are critically important uh, and I'm, I'm just delighted that, that you guys have gotten them this far this fast. Well, I, on behalf of everyone that's worked with me, I say thanks. It's not really me, but uh, I've uh, thanks. Yeah, but I, I do agree that it is, um, and we thought we we're laying the foundation and that we would get ahead of the monoclonal antibodies, and, but it's all antibodies. Um, and we're continually learning the lesson. I mean, again, uh, the data comes out. It doesn't work as well in the hospital, but we, we, we knew that in the 30s that it worked early and the better. If you waited till someone got to the hospital, these antibody therapies don't work as well. And, um, but that's, yeah, we're just, so, I mean, Eli Lilly, uh, well, I, th I think even Regeneron, that the, the trials in the hospital have not been as, um, um, yeah, it's not been as good as people would like, but we, yeah, we need to get these outpatient trials. So David, I'm going to ask a question. Um, of course, I have a self-interest in this question, but looking forward from this point forward, what, what do you think is the largest challenge facing this pair of trials? Um, I think it's, um, I think it's just patient, patient recruitment and it's a combination of getting uh, physicians to call patients and patients to engage I and mean, we've sort of overcome a little bit the diagnostic test, uh, but that's still a problem. Uh, but honestly, I think at this stage, we have the foundation in, in place and it's just a matter of execution. Um, and it, it seems like all along, I was putting together an airplane while it was flying and that's what it felt like. And, but I, would, I think right now the airplane's finally in place and we can get on with the business of going somewhere, but it's been like shifting the DCCs uh, in, in the middle of it. And then it's been shifting personnel. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, so that's been, that's been the sensation on my bit was as uh, soon as you get everything in place, then, you know, you lose an engine <laughs> and uh, got to with people or, uh, or whatever, but it's, uh, yeah, I mean, so I think, uh, right now, it's just a matter of making things, of maintaining things. We know the adage, things fall apart. And, but at this point, I think we have things together uh, and we just have to make it operate. Uh, D David, uh, this is Larry Apple. I'm uh, glad, glad to get an update on the, the status of studies. And uh, like, like uh, David Jabs, it was a, a pleasure to have a, even a minor role. I have a question about what you just said about asking about physicians asking their patients to enroll. Has the IRB required that? Because it's often, you know, there, there's an inconsistent approach. But right. no, I mean, I, I I misspoke. I meant I meant um, uh, physician recruiters calling on the phone. So we've had it seems like study coordinators calling. It's been difficult to, I guess answer questions and when we have non-physicians. Uh, so, you know, I call about uh, 20 people a night um, and ask them about, about the study. We had it set up that we had study coordinators calling during the day. There was a high level of voice messaging and the take up was low, it was 1%. I don't know if it's me or, or that people are, and you know, we do have some, uh, so I'm just, uh, it's still true though that um, physicians are still hesitant to ask their patients 
and we've been going directly to the patients. Although in the end, they about a, a 10, 20% of the time, they do talk it over with their doctors. They talk it over with their families. They send it to um, a family friend or a family member that's a doctor and say, what do you think of this? And half the time they say, this looks good. And then other times, well, they, they, they don't know. So it's not, so I had misspoken. I went, meant more that it uh, seems like physicians directly calling patients, cold calling, which we've been approved to do um, is in the pandemic is cold calling by physicians is better than cold calling by study coordinators. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, <clears throat> that's actually been shown in other studies too. Um, um, the look at study, one site used a physician and the, their, their, their um, enrollment rates were much higher. So I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah. Um, hi, Dr. Sullivan. Um, this is Lynn. Um, so I was wondering, how, how did you decide on the optimal dose that you were giving to the, these patients and how uh, did those dose compare, doses compare to uh, the studies in India, um, which they, where they used the uh, uh, coalescent plasma to Indian patient, hospitalized patients and it, it was uh, proved to be ineffective. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I mean, I would say that um, just like with the 100,000 units done here that there were uh, in the Indian study that you mentioned in the hospital that, um, and even here in the United States, that a third of the units in the United States, maybe a little bit more in India were of low titer and maybe no titer um, uh, plasma units and as far as the level of antibodies. So there is quite a disparity, a tenfold difference between an antibody level of when you dilute it out one to 100 versus one to 1,000. Um, and I mean, the dose was uh, sort of deferred a little bit to Evan, Arturo and Aaron um, on their professional opinion, 200 mils. It's a little bit of what volume is feasible, uh, but we excluded, I mean, Again, the influenza studies that didn't work in the hospital were, they had a one to 80 or one to 160 and it was influenza, a different virus. So I think you're sort of seeing that if a third of your units are very close to control or placebo and, um, that, and then, and you're giving it late, then you get these mixed results but again, I would say it's about my analogy that I think is good is if you have a cup of water, a cup of antibodies, and you light a couple matches, then that cup of water is going to be very efficient at uh, putting out the, the flame on those couple of matches, plenty of antibody to virus. But if you wait till someone comes to the hospital, um, you also have a host inflammatory reaction and um, um, the cup of water does not go very far on the raging fire. There's also some pathology data that when people die in the hospital, uh, there wasn't much virus on the pathology studies. So, and using an antiviral that late, I could also point you to uh, all the influenza stimulavir data. It's best when given within first three days of onset of illness. So we wouldn't give uh, a stimulavir on day 10 um, and in the same way, even with chickenpox or shingles, other viral infections. So it still gets back. I mean, the short answer to your question is everyone gave it late and not high enough levels. We're trying to accomplish with our outpatient trials, we want to give it early and with high levels and to document that. So I'm not, I mean, it's a, it's a data point but I'm actually not surprised by their outcome because of the, the timing and the dose. That would be my response. Good question though. That's very helpful, thank you. Hi everybody, this is Taylor speaking. I'd like to let you know that we're about five minutes past our time. So we can leave the Zoom room open for further discussion, um, but I just wanted to thank you again for your attendance and to thank uh, Dr. Sullivan for presenting with us this morning.
Yes, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Larry, Doug, Lynn. I'll end the recording at this time. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, David.